Well, hello, Ephraim, and welcome once again. And we're going to uh, talk about a topic today uh, that is uh, relevant to what we've been speaking about. And it's just breaking down things a little bit more and getting into the depth of how the Father guides us. So let's go to prayer before we start preaching, and let's open this up. Father, we come before you. We thank you, Father, for moving in our, our lives and in our walk. And we thank you for the challenges that you've put in our, our path and the challenges that sometimes we put in our own path, Father, that you help us through because your word says how we're supposed to conduct our lives. Our, your word says how you want to be worshipped. Your word says how we contact you, Father. We're grateful for that which you have scribed into your word, Father, by men that you have purposed their hearts over the errors of time, Father, so that we can walk a godly life unto you by following your ways and your word. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. So we left off, and we've been talking about uh, guidance, but there's a, a formula that is, has been formulated, and that is an ongoing thing that we're, we're talking about on how to properly connect and communicate and get God's attention and God get your attention, while at the same time guarding yourself from familiar spirits. And this is divine guidance. Now, today's topic, in which we're going to dive into here in a second, is called The Ordinary and the Exceptional. The Ordinary and the Exceptional, and that's the title for today. You see, but let's do a quick, short review, three points. We've always got to look for things in the Scriptures. Can you find what you're being told? Can you find what's going on? Can you find it in the Scriptures first? The second one? God's voice and what you believe God is telling you. And then we have the circumstances. And that's the, the basic one, two, three of how God guides us and how he has set up his guidance system because that determines how you are guided. And if you get it wrong, you get to do it all over again. But it's about the word, it's about the spirit of the Holy Ghost, and it's about the circumstances. That's how you get divine guidance from the Father and what you're trying to seek Him for. You see, it doesn't come down to gold dust. It doesn't come down to anything like that. It doesn't come down to anything that we think, or I think it should be like this. It has nothing to do with any of that. That's a bunch of bull. What it comes down to is everything has to be found in the Word of God. You know, you get some guys, well, God told me that I should go do this, or God told me I should do it like this, or God told me I should divorce my wife and I'm supposed to marry his wife over there. That's not found in the Scripture. If it's not found in the Scripture, blow it off. It has to line up with the consistency of the Word because the Word is God speaking to us and He's already told us how to do all of this stuff. Now, when you look at the circumstances, and we, one of the main ways that God does deal with this, it's moving the circumstances in your life that hinder us. And that's one thing that we've always done. You see, you're, you can do that. You're supposed to do that. And the circumstances that we've been talking about for the last few weeks, though, are the circumstances that you face that aren't reality. And that's where you've got to have, you know what? If the circumstance doesn't line up, if I'm supposed to go to China to preach the Word of God, and I haven't got the resources, and God hasn't provided the re resources in advance, well, then guess what? There's an opportunity to go over to you know, Mexico, and somebody's saying, hey, I got a ticket for you. You got this, I got that. It's all paid for. You're like, well, that's a circumstance. That's a type of guidance that God uses. Obviously, you can't deny the realities that are right in front of you with some of these things. You see, if you're led to, to believe that you're supposed to do something or go somewhere, make sure it lines up and make sure the circumstances line up. And then you're supposed to say, well, what about faith? We'll talk about faith here in a minute within that whole thing because faith is still involved in that. But to have faith in something prior to, if God wants me to go to China to preach, He's going to provide the resources prior to that to, have, to, to go. That's faith, and you can have faith into that. It's not fly to China, and then when you get there, i got to come home, and I don't have the resources, now I'm stuck. And now what are you doing? You're begging, you're begging, you can't do this, you can't get around where you're supposed to go, you can't, and everything's just a mess. Why? You miss God. You miss God. Circumstances. You see, the circumstances have all got to be weighed out when it comes to guidance. Now, when we look into the ordinary 
and the extreme. There are two different types of ways that God deals with mankind. You see, but us as believers, and over the eras of time, we've always gotten into an over-dependency of the exceptional. The exceptional. And then at times we even get to the point in time of rejection of the exceptional. And sometimes we get into the ordinary. Sometimes we reject the ordinary. People reject the ordinary. Not too, much, too many people reject the ordinary. See, the problem is, though, is that the exceptional is to get into the spirit world and hear what? A voice. Get into the deep things, the, the big things of God. But people start saying, oh, you have to have, it's got to be like that. That's the exceptional circumstances. You see, hearing the voice is a skill that has got to be learned. And if you're just going to open yourself up to anything, you're going to hear a voice, all right? I've been saying that for three weeks now. You see, it doesn't happen just because you get saved and you get filled. You don't automatically just start hearing the voice of God. It's a skill. And we're giving you the process in order to get to that point so that you can hear the voice of God for your life. You see, this it's a skill. But the word... And the first way, the first way to be led is by the Word of God. Let's keep it simple. The first way is to be led by the Word of God. It's the learning of the Word that has got all the answers in which you need to have a successful and a deep core relationship and walk with the Father where He communicates with you and you communicate with Him. It's found in the Scripture. You see, we've talked about how to be guided and and it, that can be tricky to step over into the spirit world and operate in the spirit world. That can be tricky because there's always an opportunity for failure. There's always an opportunity where you open yourself up to something and familiar spirits come in. You look at a lot of the false prophets. You look at a lot of the you know, false prophecy. And if you want to look at exceptional, go study that series out about false prophets and false prophecy. I think I did that maybe about a year and a half ago. I did a teaching on that. But you can see that there's exceptional there. See, the problem that happens, though, is that people start saying God said this and, and God didn't say that. Then you're cursed with a curse. You and your family. And it's not just the person that says it, it's also the people that hear it. And that stuff has got to be ripped out. You see, you have to examine these things and you have to look at them in depth and make sure that they line up with the Word of God. And that's why... People that are out here having a dream of maybe some type of destruction or something across the face of the earth. And it comes from a pastor and somebody says, well, I'm a pastor and this is what came to me. That doesn't work like that. That's not how God operates. It's wrong. Those things come to prophets. Always have, always will. You see, and when you get into the dream thing, dreams are tricky and dreams are, are, are probably one of the least respected, I'll put it, use that word, ways of doing something in the eyes of God almost, because it has to be interpreted. Anything outside of a dream where you can understand for yourself and for your life, well, you had a dream that, you know, maybe I shouldn't do that tomorrow. Well, then don't do it. But if you're going to have a dream about somebody else or for somebody else or something else, or some big thing that's going to happen, some event that's going to happen, that has got to be interpreted. That is consistent with the Word of God to do it like that. Any other way is inconsistent with God and red flags should go up everywhere. It's not God. So what happen ne happens next? Those people, those people end up saying, well, well, what they don't end up saying is that they miss God. They don't end up owning up to it and they got to come up with every type of excuse and, you know, it's wrong. And they're just flat out wrong. They miss God. You see, but these people tend to lean to the exceptional in the spirit world. They lean to the exceptional in the spirit world. Not, that's not ordinary. That's not an ordinary. That's an exceptional event that God does. You see, when you look at the, the timeline in the book of Acts, the book of Acts lasts for about, it lasts for about 60 years. And you can see over the course of that, the 60 years in the book of Acts, you can see that there is a great exceptional in operation all the way through the book of Acts. And the book of Acts is not done being written. We are going to write 
the end of the book of Acts. There's no amen at the end of it. You see, what did we see during that time frame of that 60 years that the Yeshua and, and the brothers and everybody, that the stories that were told, he saw the blind see, the lame walk, the dead raised. We saw gates that were, that were locked, doors that were locked, swing open. We saw chains that were probably around their arms and their wrists holding them in prison. We saw those chains just up and nowhere, out of nowhere fall off. We saw things like Ananias and Sapphira and things that happened with them when they came and they lied to the Holy Ghost and next thing you know, they fall dead. Those are exceptional things in operation. You see, but we see these things happen over that amount of time within that 60-year span, and somewhere we've gone backwards from it. And now we've got a church world out here that lives in such a fictitious way. They think that they can just do this stuff overnight. You cannot do this overnight. There's a procedure. There's a process to it in order to get to that point. Because what you've got to do is you have to develop yourself through the stages of growth. You see, another exceptional way of guidance, and we're going to give some scriptural reference to this stuff in a minute here. Another exceptional way of guidance is angels. Ministering spirits is what they are. Sent out to do what? To render service for the sake of those who inherit salvation. We've inherited salvation as believers. You've got legions of angels around you. Legions of angels around you. In Hebrews 1, 13 and 14, a couple of verses here. Moreover, to which of the angels he has ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Aren't they merely spirits who serve, sent out to help those whom God will deliver? That's what they are there for. And that's where we do have to move into that in the end times. you got to look at when they came out of, out of Egypt. And we're going to be doing an exodus once again, so there's going to be some parallels that run with that. But the angel was what? The angel brought manna for 40 years. You know, when it comes down to the time of the mark of the beast, what are you going to rely on? You're not going to be able to buy. You're not going to be able to sell. What are you going to do? Have you thought about these things? What about heat for your house? What about gas? If you need gas in the car, you can be able to get in the car when it's on E and drive for, you know, 100, 200 miles when you can't buy or you can't sell anything. See, these are exceptional measures where the angelic will fill the need for you when it comes to the things with food. You put up food, they can supply. you got to do your portion, though. It all comes down to even what happened in the Scripture there. The barrel of flour, the jug of oil, is not going to go empty. Your needs will be met and they will keep being replenished and replenished and replenished regardless because of the angelic and what the angelic can do. But that is another type of, gu of guidance. You see, it doesn't come down to get in trouble and just yell help. You have to, first of all, help yourself first. You've got to be able to do the things that you've been instructed to do, one, through what uh, God has sent down to the face of the earth through His prophets, and that's put up a year's supply worth of food. You do everything that you can do. And if you can't put up a year's supply worth of food, if you can only put up a can of tuna once a month, and that's all you've got, and you're, then you've done your 100%, and that's all that matters. God's not looking at dollar value here. God is looking at heart value here. He's looking at percentage of commitment that you'll show to the cause and what the instruction was that He sent to the face of the earth. How committed are you to the cause? You see, but that's an, another exceptional means by which God does a type of guiding. Acts 27, verse 21. But after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and occurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve. That's strong. So what's he saying here? Even though you didn't listen to me, the ship's going to go down, but we're going to be saved. No one's going to die out of this. Learn your lesson, though, guys. You see, again, that is extraordinary. 
And that doesn't happen every day. You don't cross over like that every day. But there are reasons for these things. Now again, he wasn't going out looking and trying to get over there. It happened. And that's what you got to do. Keep it simple. Live your life and it will happen. It will happen. Just grow and grow and grow. Again, extraordinary. Extraordinary event. You see, you want to look at some more extraordinary events? Go look at the 75 visitations. I don't know if anybody's done a teaching on that. You see, again, exceptional circumstances. Exceptional circumstances. But when an angel shows up, God is trying to get something done. You see, most people, when they start talking about, oh, I saw an angel, or I saw this, and I... There's no reason behind it. And if there's no reason behind it, it's not consistent with Scripture. They're not here to say hello. They're not here to be your best buddy. They're not just, oh, i got nothing better to do. Let's pop over and we'll just say hi. That's not reality. That's not consistent with the, with the Word of God and the way that God utilizes His ministering angels. If they didn't come to minister, guess what? They don't just show up and say hi. They don't just show up and make themselves visible and then turn around and do nothing. Well, I saw the angel over there and I saw the gold on the tip of the wings. No, you didn't. If you did see something like that, you saw a familiar spirit because they come for a purpose. They come for a purpose. And if that's going on, well, then you probably need to be delivered. You see, there's churches out here, though, that do see angels every service. That's not the rule. That's not the way God wants it, but that's their rule. They don't make that the exception. They make that the ordinary. And that's not an ordinary thing. And that's why you've got to be so careful with this. Same with dreams. Be careful with it. You get into that stuff, you're opening yourself up if you don't know the rules to the game. You get in trouble. You see, that's why we caution you. Because these are ways to reach over and touch into the other side. And God's trying to get you to understand that that is going to happen within your lives. It's going to happen within your lives, but you have to allow it to happen. You try forcing God's hand, you try putting it out there and trying to you know, cry for a dream, or you're trying to tap into the other... You're going to tap into the other side, all right. You're going to open up something that you don't want any part of. Now you look at somebody even like Daniel in the lion's den. What happened with Daniel in the lion's den? There was innocency found within him. Well, how did that happen? Well, first of all, he kept the law. He was keeping the commandments of God. He was pleasing the Father. And because he was doing that, the Father saw innocency in him. But he did what he had to do, and he was able to survive that situation. And this is why it's so important that our lives have to be straightened out with God for it to work for you. It's got to be straightened out for, for it to work for your family and so that they can reap the benefit of that. You see, but people get some, some people get so convinced that they're so close and they're getting into some type of a divine guidance and yet they're so far from it that they don't even know. Let me tell you something. It's God's business, but He will get it done. It's God's business. It's God's timing, but He will get it done if you do your part. If you do your part, God will do His. It's a common theme throughout Scripture. If you do your part, God will do His. And you look around and you look in the natural and it looks like it, it doesn't look good right now. It looks impossible. It looks like we're fighting a losing battle. But with God, all things are possible. You see, when you step over to the other side, the rules of the game are completely different than what operates on this side. You see, but what's God doing on the face of the earth right now? He's raising up a people. We are the generation. We are the quick work. We are the ones who will be doing the greater works. You see, we're not the only gang in town, though. There are others out here like us that are seeking the face of God, that are trying to teach and preach the, the righteousness, teach and preach the things of, of the Father, teach and preach the commandments of God and teach and preach the testimony of Jesus Christ, which in the end, that's all that really matters throughout the entirety of the book. That pretty much sums it up. 
A major point, there are signs that are, super, that are supernatural phenomenon, and they're ordained by God to act as a symbol or a point of rec- recognition on the journey He has assigned each one of us. There are signs that are supernatural phenomenon ordained by God. Signs. Signs. You know, they asked Yeshua, what's the sign of the end time? This is a good way to stop the so-called crap that goes on out here. Ask for a sign. I've asked for signs. I've asked people for signs. You want to do that? What's the sign? Show me the sign. Demand. You are entitled to demand a sign. If someone's going to stand up and tell you something for your life, or somebody's going to say something and prophesy, you have a right to demand for a sign. You realize that? If they can't give you a sign, all they are is what? So-called prophets? Maybe immature prophets? But something's got to stop the crap, and I have a better word that Chris would really appreciate. There's a lot of crap that goes on out here. And this is one way to stop it. You see, if you're going to take a chance with cursing your family and opening your mouth and people wanting to do this and do that, every time somebody stands up and says, God says, and they're wrong. How, many of this go, how much of this goes on on Sunday mornings? In churches all over the place. People standing up and God said this and God said that. The person's cursed, their family's cursed, and anybody who heard it, anybody who listens to it is cursed. Then you have the right to ask for a sign. Though if someone's going to do that, what's the sign? Because God will provide the sign. You know, you get a lot of that with traveling preachers. Growing up, we had all kinds of traveling preachers that would come around. But they're famous They're famous for it. And what do the pastors do? They don't do anything about it. They don't stand up to it at all. What they should be told is you can come into my my assembly and you can preach there, but if you're going to prophesy, you better give give the sign to me prior to first. Give me the sign first. It ends a lot of the garbage. Ends a lot of the garbage because a lot of times they're out there traveling around and they're too immature in the prophetic realm to be even doing it. And they get people in trouble. See, how do you stop yourself from making a back end of a donkey? Jackass? Is that, is that a better word? Out of yourself. Is to ask for a sign before for yourself. God, please, can I have done this more times than, than not. I could give you signs that I have received for certain things. If the sign doesn't come, shut up. Shut up and just act like you never even heard anything. Well, I thought I was supposed to do that, God. I thought you were telling me that. What, what, what happened? That You didn't give me the sign. Oh, it was you on that side. Ah, keep your conversation internal. Realize that, hey, it can happen. But if the sign comes, the prophe- and then the, what if the prophecy doesn't come to pass? You ever think of that? The sign comes and the prophecy doesn't come, pa- come to pass. You are operating in a familiar spirit and you're getting hit from both sides and it's not going to work for you at all. You need serious deliverance at that point in time. Now let's look at in 1 Samuel 10, verse 1. 1 Samuel 10, 1. And I love this story because it leads into David down the road, but we're not going to tell tell the whole thing. 1 Samuel 10, 1. Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, It's not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance. When you have departed from me today, you will find two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin of Zilzah. And they will say to you, the donkeys which you went to look for haven't been found. And now your your father has ceased caring about the donkeys and is worried about you saying, what shall I do about my son? Then you shall go forward from there and come to the Tebarinth tree of Tebur. 
There three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you. One carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine. What's he saying here? He said, this is what's going to happen. He is giving him a sign. A very, very specific sign. See, prophets have to go through the same testing and the same trials as everybody else. The difference is you're going to hear for you and we got to stand up and put it all on the line. You see, most people, most people get into things just like this guy. He got off sidetracked after he got into it okay, and then he got off sidetracked. And what happened? Most people don't fulfill the calling in their life. Most people have excuses. But as we say, God doesn't care about your excuses. You're going to be judged. You're going to be judged if you fulfilled the anointing that has been placed within your life or you did not fulfill the anointing that has been placed within your life. Everybody's got an anointing. Everybody in this room, everybody out there, everybody's got an anointing. And what's it going to be like if you don't fulfill it? How embarrassing will it be? Let's look at it and put it in a realistic mindset where you can actually put a, a picture to it. You're going to stand up in front of some of the prophets, Ezekiel, Daniel, even Yeshua. And just, I, I didn't get it done. I didn't get done what God wanted me to get done. What I was placed here on the face of the earth. I was, you know, too busy about this. Or I had my own way that I was going to do it. I made it my own set of rules how I was going to do it. I went down the wrong path, but I didn't realize that God, you know, all this other stuff happened. But God's like, I have consistency all the way through my word. All you had to do was run a little bit of a parallel. All you had to do was read. Meditate on my word that I have placed in front of you so that you can get it right. You know, and then you get into the stripes that are going to be born on that day. Could you imagine? I can't even imagine what that day will be like. I imagine that will be the worst day for mankind. That will be absolute hell. On earth, or in heaven. But it will be... a. I can't imagine having to stand there and take stripes that day because of the things that we screwed up for down here. Talk about a long day and a day that you're just never going to probably forget. But thank goodness God forgives and He forgets. But all because what? Again, because we couldn't get around to fulfilling the anointing within our life. You know, there's people out here who need to be saved, who need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. They need to be healed. They need to be delivered. God is raising up an army and all He wants you to do is be part of His army and bring your arsenal of weaponry to His army. Maybe, it's a, maybe you're a prayer warrior. There's people out there that are praying. That some, you can feel the prayers. There's people out there that pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and thank God that they are or we'd probably all be dead already. Thank God for the prayer warriors. You see, but God's raising up an army, but an army has all got to be on the same page. they got to know who, what, when, where, how. What authority they sit under. And who that authority is. And how that authority is supposed to act. Again, it's all written in the Scripture. It's all written in the Scripture. And when it's all written in the Scripture, how are you going to receive it? Are you going to reject that too? You see, you're going to have to give an account, as we all have to give an account. But your anointing is not based on conditions, and it's not conditional. Your anointing is set for you to produce. For you to produce. And if you don't, and if you can't, and if you refuse, and if you won't, you can't blame God. You can't blame me. You can't blame your wife. You're going to stand up there on the day of stripes and you're going to give an answer for your life. Well, they were so mean to me. Well, who was persecuted first? Jesus Christ hung on a tree. They persecuted Him. 
Nobody's asking us to die on a tree. They tortured him. They killed him. Did he want to do it? Well, he did say, let this cup pass for me, but if it's your will, Father, I'll do it. Let me ask you this. Did he do it for himself? No, he didn't do it for himself. He did it for you, and he did it for me. But he fulfilled the anointing within his life. He fulfilled so that we can have eternal life. Are you going to fulfill the anointing within your life so that somebody else may have eternal life as well? By you going up and talking to them and doing whatever you've got to do? By utilizing the anointing and allowing the anointing of God Almighty working through you? Again, what are you going to tell Elijah? What are you going to tell Samuel? What are you going to tell David? What are you going to tell Moses? You see, we're here. They're not. We are. This is for us. This is for us to work. This is our day. This is our hour. And you're going to, they're going to ask, did you do it or not? Or they're going to say, what was it like? Well, hopefully you can say, well, you should have been there. It was, it was great. We were doing this and we were doing that and all this was happening. And the armies were dropping and we were... Because you kept the commandments of God the way that God wanted you to keep them. Because keeping the commandments of God is doing what? It's serving God. Because you serve God the way that God wants to be served. Amen. You see, it's your obligation. They had an obligation. We have an obligation on the face of the earth this day and this hour. You've got a set obligation within your anointing. I've got a set obligation within my anointing. Uh, something that we are going to have to give an account for. See, you have to work the works of God. And you can work the works of God. But we're guiding you and you use divine guidance to get to that point. And the biggest way to step over to the other side, and the, one of the only ways, is to put your flesh down and get your flesh in line. And I know I'm jumping way ahead right now. You see, but it's your obligation. And that's why we've all got to just roll up our sleeves and dig into this whole thing. Or some people are out there, they're just waiting to hear a bad story. A bad report. What do they, people do? Oh, what? 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 And what do they do? They've opened up their heart to the other side. Satan will come to steal to kill, and to destroy any way, shape, or form that he can try to do it. And that's why you've constantly got to be on guard. Constantly be on guard for the infiltration from the spirit world into your life. You see, the calling within your life, the calling within your life is in your heart. I know it talks in Scripture about out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, but that's not the calling. That's the confirmation. There's a process even to that. You see, the calling within your life was set from the foundations of the world for me to be on the face of this earth for this day, for this hour, for you to be on the face of this earth, the earth for this day, for this hour, for God to utilize the anointing within your life for the battle that's being fought on the face of the earth between him and his arch rival. Sounds like a cartoon. Sounds like Batman and Robin taking on everybody else. You know what it is? It's a fight of light and dark. And that's why you've got to allow your light to shine through. Allow your light to shine through. You see, when God looked at Jeremiah, what did he tell him in the Scripture? Yeah, I ordained you. I knew you when you were in your mother's belly. You were ordained from the foundations of the earth. I knew you were supposed to be a prophet. You were that up in heaven. Did you hear me? He was communicating with the Father up there. And you've got to realize the authority that you have got while you're on the face of this earth because of the Father that you have that loves you and the power that He gave you as His kids. We've got the authority through God. You see, all things are possible. All things are possible to Him that believe. Realize 
you've got the authority. I'm going to tell a little story. This is kind of a little goofy story. I was sitting in my garage about three weeks ago with my wife. And I said, watch this. She looked at me and she said, what are you talking about? I said, there's a caterpillar on the floor, on the, right on the other side of the garage. I said, watch this. And I called him over. And he took about 45 minutes to crawl over and he climbed right over on, and he came right up and climbed right on top of my shoe. And I just kept, he'd stop and he'd look around. I was like, come on. And he'd get back down and all 800 legs would go and he'd worked his way over. Now, what's the difference between that and the beast of the field, the fish of the sea? It's about taking and utilizing the authority that has been given to us, told us in Scripture, and saying that you've got authority over everything. But that little caterpillar crawled all the way across my garage floor, straight direct at me, and climbed right up on top of my shoe. My wife just looked there and she said, that's unbelievable. But you know what? It's just utilizing and knowing, knowing, knowing the authority that you have. And I didn't kill him. I let him go. But know what you got. Know the power. 1 Samuel 10.4 And they will greet you and will give you two loaves of bread which you shall receive from their hands. Very specific again. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. Now, you get into this, you are turned over into another man. Turning into another man. It's like a dream. I've had a few ex pretty heavy-duty experiences with some of this. It's like a dream, but then that dream's like it didn't even exist. But when you walk and you get into the other side, it's like there's, there's nothing material. And it's just, it happens, you come out, and then you're like, what just happened? But it's, it, it really happened, but it's like it didn't happen. See, because what happens is you walk into a world that's not hindered by flesh. It's not hindered by blood. It's... It's not hindered by materialism. Now, when I was had, I'll speak specific to one example. Was I trying to get over to the other side? Was I trying to force my way over to the other side? Absolutely not. I pulled in my driveway in the car and I barely got the car put in park. I was actually speeding in the driveway because I knew, oh, here we go. Got the car put in park and there I went. But it's not hindered by materialism. It's not hindered by anything. But I wasn't trying. You'll see all through Scripture, these guys weren't trying to force their way through with a spiritual crowbar into the other world. It happens, and that's why you have to keep it simple. Sit back, relax, enjoy the ride. And it'll happen in God's time because that's His world, and He controls that. We don't get to. 1 Samuel 10, verse 7. And then let it be when these signs come to you that you do as the occasion demands, God, you, for God is with you. Let me read that out of the, the CJB. When these signs come to you, just do whatever you feel like doing because God is with you. He's saying what? Do what you want. Do what you want. And God will honor it. And then what happens? Well, let's flip over a few chapters and see what happens to this character. 1 Samuel 16, verse 14. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. An evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold, now an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. You see, now at this point in time, we started talking off, we hear about this guy, you're going to go here, prophesy, you're going to meet these guys, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. Saul cannot prophesy in the Spirit of God anymore at this point in time. Why? Because now he's got an evil spirit on him. He can't become that other man anymore and walk over and step over to the other side because of that evil spirit. Because you cannot bring that into light. Now there's people that like to try and get over there and force their way over, and they use it through the eyes of darkness. You see, he didn't know that he had an evil spirit come upon him. 
What are we talking about here? We're talking about the anointing. We are talking about supernatural events. We are talking about the signs that the supernatural phenomenon ordained by God to act as a symbol or a point of recognition on our journey that He has assigned each and every one of us. And we've all got a journey. We've all got a journey. You see, you got to realize, without the anointing, you are not capable. With the anointing, you are capable to be successful. With the anointing, you are capable, as you develop that, able to step into the other side. You see, the anointing, what's it do? It destroys the yoke. And it destroys the yoke of bondage. You see, that's why we've got full authority over everything. Everything on the face of the earth. Anything that swims in the sea. Over the animals, the fish, the rain, the drought, the diseases. We've, you've got to realize the authority that we carry. You see, it doesn't rotate around us, though. It rotates around God. But man tries to implement his ways into it, and that's where we get screwed up with it. Because now it's become what? Our ways? Our ways are not the Father's ways. It rotates around the Father. And that's why when we work the works of God, there's no glory in it. There's no glory in it. The only one who gets the glory is the Father. Why? Because we're just mere human beings. It's just about the anointing within your life that God has placed within your life. He's the healer. He's the deliverer. You're just the vessel that comes up and says, I need this. And then there's another vessel that says, well, God's got this. Nobody can heal anybody. It all comes from the supernatural side of it. It all comes from the Father. And that's why it's so important to get into fasting and, and prayer. It's the fasting that moves you over into the supernatural along with prayer. That's what moves you over into the supernatural. Because you're putting your flesh down. You're dematerializing. You see, that's why this is a lifestyle. You want to walk over into the supernatural side, it is a lifestyle that you have got to live. You have got to pay a price. But you've got to pay a price and realize it's not us. It's paying a price for the greater good of the Father. And that's why you've got to bring your flesh to that point in time where it's dying. That's how you do it. That's how you get to the other side. We're talking about divine guidance here. That's how you get to the other side. You know, you look at people, and I know it happened with, with Prophet, with his father. And I had a, the, the same experience with my grandmother, where his father was dying, and he, would, he said to him, he said, here, Dad, hold my hand. He said, when you see the angel... He said, squeeze my hand. He squeezed his hand when he was just going and he raised his arms up. My grandmother did the exact same thing. And she screamed out, Jesus! As she was passing, raised her hands up. You see, but there are reasons for this stuff. Because people are dying like that. They are getting caught up between this world and the other world. And I'm telling you how to get into the other world properly. Properly. There's things and there's rules to the game that you've got to achieve in order to get over there properly and safely and come back without being what? Running into darkness when you're over there? Running into a familiar spirit? You see, we're talking about going over to the other side. You see, there's a reason why God forbid us to, to go to wizards or, or to necromancers or soothsayers, or, or witches. Because He was not going to allow His people to go over to the other side unclean. Over into His realm unclean. He wants us to go into His realm His way because He is God and He controls that. And that's where you want to get a curse upon yourself? Go see a palm reader. Go see a palm reader. It's right in the Scriptures. You see, because that's working in a familiar spirit. Just like false prophets. False prophecy. The difference is palm readers will get more right than those guys. 
They're still not going to get it all right because God still controls that other side. But what happens is that people get convinced, but it's convincing through the wrong spirit. It's convincing through the wrong spirit. Again, God's the healer. You have to produce an anointing, but God is the healer. Same anointing. Same anointing that Saul had. Same anointing that Samuel had. Same anointing that Ezekiel had. The key is to get everybody operating in their anointing. Getting everyone to work the works of God. And in order to do that, we've got to learn to, again, make lists. You're, don't be so proud. And don't think we're anybody's above it. Make lists. Fast. Pray. This is how, and this is the rule, this is the formula to get over to the other side. Or is this the game of, I can't? Or I feel weak? Or I can't fast that long, I can, my, my vision goes and... Good. Get your flesh under control. Get your flesh to the point where it thinks it's dying. Let your spirit man take over, but you have to put down the materialistic of the flesh in order for it to happen. Fast, pray, work on things constantly and making sure that things don't come back around and bite you on the other side. You see, signs must point to something. And sometimes for the difficulties ahead. Let's go to Exodus 3 verse 1. Signs must point to something, sometimes for the difficulties ahead. Exodus 3, 1, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jeth Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consuming, was not consumed. Was that a big-time sign? Well, it was a big-time sign. It was a big-time event. We know that. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see, these, see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he had turned to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. So what was Moses doing? Let's back up. Moses was tending to the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the back desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Don't forget that. Again, the angel of God was involved with this whole thing. Again, an exceptional phenomenon. An exceptional phenomenon. You see, things go past what you see, what you think, and they go past what you leave and believe. You know that there are people who have trouble just believing that this stuff can actually happen? But let me ask you this question. What was Moses doing at the time? What was Moses doing at the time? Okay, let's read it again. He was tending to the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame. Was he looking for it? No! He wasn't looking for it. You go all the way through Scripture, you don't see people looking for it. You look at the young lad there, Samuel. Hey, get up. Would you call me? No, go back to bed, kid. Go back to bed, kid, three times. Oh, I know what's going on. Was he looking for it? He was learning the voice of God. He was learning the voice of God. He, Moses wasn't looking for it. You see, you start going out there and you start looking to have a dream or you force yourself, I want to have a vision. Stop inviting familiar spirits into your life and stop inviting familiar spirits into the ministry within your life. Stop destroying the anointing within your life. You see, if God wants you to have one, you will have one. It's His world that you're entering. You see, and if you seek after one, you're going to have a dream. You're going to have that vision that you're forcing yourself into. And familiar spirits are going to come and they are going to have a heyday because the biggest playground that's out there is where? Right here, your mind. 
It's the biggest playground that Satan has to play in. But at the same time, they don't read your mind, do they? No, they listen to what you say. They listen to how you act. Or they watch how you act. They watch how you react. They see if you act sick. They see if you look sick, if you're acting, talking sick. If you're showing them that you're sick. They don't know your symptoms until you open up your mouth and tell them your symptoms. They don't see into the other side. But when you open up your mouth, I want a dream, or I want a vision, or I want this, or I want that, and you're trying to work your way in the other side with a crowbar, let me tell you something, they're in business. You've just opened yourself up. Be very careful. Be very careful. You see, because what that, what that does is everybody tries to get out there and be God's little helper. Asking for a dream, asking for this. No, when God wants you guided, you'll get guided. Until then, you know where your guidance comes from? The Word of God. The Word of God. Let that be your light. And let it shine out there so people can see Christ in you, raiding out of you. You see, we are supposed to ask for things. In Scripture, it talks about, hey, ask for things. And you know what? You don't get them because you don't ask for them. But it never talks about asking for a dream or for a vision. That's where people get in trouble. Forcing your way through. Again, ask for a sign. Ask for a sign. You see, prophet, after 31 years of ministry, the angel finally showed up and told him, the angel finally showed up and told him, you don't have to lay fleeces out anymore. You don't have to ask for signs anymore because God's going to honor your words. Until that point in time, we had better damn well lay out fleeces because we can be fooled. I lay out fleeces and I use fleeces quite often. You see, you can't just be turned loose with this. Because the very thing that you get turned loose with would be the very thing that beats you in the end. You see, God has to know that He can trust you before He can let you get into the place where you can work these types of miracles and have these types of encounters. You have to learn how. It's not, oh, send the angel, I need to talk. It's not, oh God, I need some guidance over here, so you know what, just, come on. No. No. He's going to say, get back into my word first. Go find it in there first. The angels come when they're sent. And if you're into that stuff, you're going to get in trouble. Guard yourself with everything you've got. And that's why I say, keep it simple. Just be yourself. And if it's going to come into your life, it's going to come. Keep it simple. And if it doesn't, be glad you don't have to. Be glad you don't have to. Nobody wants to stand up and take obligation and responsibility for other people, but yet people want to volunteer to get into all this other stuff, prophecy, and they think they're going to... No, you don't want it. The easiest place and the best place to sit as far as I'm concerned is in the back row. Again, Christ bore the stripes so that we could use His name Again, don't think so highly of yourself. None of us should. None of us should. We're just all tools in a toolbox. Some are screwdrivers. Some are meatheads. Some are wrenches. Drills. Sockets. Ratchets. But every tool has a purpose. But if we think that one is better than the other, we're all all in trouble. God is looking for you. He's looking for you to walk and He's looking to guide you into all truth, all righteousness. He's looking to guide you into the other side, into the supernatural, where He can communicate with you. You see, He's the healer. He's the deliverer. He's the miracle worker. 
But just be yourself. And if it's going to come into your life, it's going to come. And God has control. Let's close in prayer. Father, we come before You and we thank You for Your Word, Father. We thank You for the message that You sent down to Your prophet, our mentor, so that we could learn, Father, how it is to walk and how You want us to walk. And all-inclusively, Father, how You want to be worshipped and how we can access You, Father. We're grateful for Your Word, the instruction within it, Father, to keep us clean, keep us holy. Lead us, guide us, Father, into all truth. Let Your Word come forth. Let us see things in there in the depth of it, Father, that we've never seen before, even though it's been right in front of our eyes. Let Your revelatory come forward out of it, Father. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Well, have a good week, everybody, and we'll see you next week.